guys, welcome back to Nadir Audio. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the Rotel CD11 Tribute CD player. So I bought the CD11 to replace my aging Ankyo C7030 CD player. So I've used that for the last few years, the entire time that I've had this channel. And for the majority of that time, I've used it as a transport only, just because I think it sounds a lot better with an external DAC than it does using its own built-in DAC. But that said, that player still works and I'm going to be able to pull that into one of the other stereos in one of the other rooms in the house. So it's not going to go to waste, uh, but I wanted to replace it with a more modern and uh, slightly more expensive CD player. So I think the Rotel is about twice the MSRP of the Ankyo when it was new, uh, but it's currently uh, no longer manufactured. So in this video, we're going to be comparing against that player but we're also going to be playing it against my Oppo BDP-103 Blu-ray player, which is an excellent CD player in its own right, but I also use it to play Blu-rays, and I also use it for my very small collection of SACDs. And one of the nice things about having a separate Blu-ray and CD player is that I don't watch a lot of movies, but when I do, I typically can't get through with them in one sitting. So it's nice to be able to just leave the disc in the player and then come back to where you left off also, because the Oppos are no longer manufactured, they don't make players anymore. I believe that the BDP-103 was their second to last entry-level player. But you know, when it eventually dies, I, I would have to replace it with something used. It probably would be hard to get serviced. So it's nice to have another player so that when one of them gives up the ghost, uh, we have another one to play until I come up with a replacement. Uh, so in this video, we'll be comparing them as CD players, and then in the end, I'll have a short section where we also compare them as transports as well. So why do they call it the CD11 Tribute? Well that's actually a reference to the engineer Ken Ishiwata. So if you're familiar with the history of Marantz or Rotel, you may have heard of him, but he was sort of a legendary engineer that did a lot of work for those companies. And this was going to be his last project. So the idea is that he was going to take the existing CD11 and upgrade all the components in the signal path and try to give it better clarity and detail retrieval and dynamics and that sort of thing. Unfortunately, he passed away before he was able to finish this project, so they've labeled it with a tribute badge in honor of him. So one of the things that drew me to the CD11 is that it comes in this really nice brush metal version, which I think is nice and clean looking. It's a little bit retro looking, but not too retro. Uh, I really like the way that it looks, and generally if there is a brush metal version of any component, I will usually pick it. Uh, so we don't have too many controls on here. We do have our power control over here on the left, which is an actual switch. So if you turn that on, you can hear a, a relay click, and then the unit will come to life. And then we have our LED indicator. Uh, when it's blue, it indicates that the unit's on. Now, if you leave this sitting for a while and you're not playing a disc, it will eventually go into standby mode, at which point that LED will turn red. But you can turn it back on with the remote when it is in standby mode. So the display is this backlit display that's... I like it. It's it's really visible from across the room, uh, which is a nice thing. I did think it was a little strange looking at first how they have this kind of black panel, but only part of it lights up with the backlit. Uh, but in in reality, I, I got used to that pretty quickly, and I don't even really notice that anymore. Now, the transport is just a plastic transport, but it feels pretty sturdy. I don't have any concerns with it. It's similar to the ones on the other two players. The only part that's metal is this little trim piece right out here in front. Uh, so we can go ahead and put in a CD, and then if we click our open close button, it will load the CD, and that's really it. We don't get much else on the front except for your basic transport controls. Uh, but I do really like the way it looks, and you get a lot more features with the remote that we'll go over a little later in the video. But first, let's take a quick look at the back panel. Okay, so not too much going on in the back panel here. We have our standard analog out left and right. And then for a digital out, we just have our coax. Uh, we don't have a Toslink optical out, which is fairly typical of modern components or any other digital outputs. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, all of the DACs that I own, including the one that we're going to be using later in this video, have a coax in, so that should be fine. So there is an RS-232 interface here, which I think is just for servicing the unit. Uh, we also have a Rotel link in and a 12 volt trigger in. Uh, you may use the, those if you're using Rotel components, but for us, we're just gonna be using the analog out and the digital out. So while we have this thing out, let's take the cover off and take a quick look at what's inside. <laughs> 
Okay, so opening the unit up, uh, we have just pretty standard circuit board and transport. Uh, the transport does have a metal chassis around it, and everything seems to be decent quality. Uh, but you can see we just cannot get a basic transformer over here. Uh, they have a little plastic cover over some of the other high voltage uh, components. And then we have a board here with just uh, standard uh, capacitors and other things in the chipsets. Uh, so we don't see the kind of higher end stuff you would see in the more expensive Rotel CD players. Uh, there's no toroidal transformer uh, and there's not any kind of heavy duty damping going on in here. Now this is something that you could add additional yourself and that's something I may do in the future. Uh, but for now it just looks like a kind of a standard CD player at the $600 range. So that's that's fine. So we'll go ahead and put the cover back on and we'll put this back in the system and we'll take a listen to it. So I wanted to do a quick comparison on the remotes for these devices. So the Rotel does come with a full-size black plastic remote. It can control all the features of the unit and it's large enough that it feels fine in the hand and you can press the buttons and they feel fine as well. My only slight gripe with this remote is that the transport buttons themselves are a little bit on the small side, uh, so that can make it a little harder to use, but overall it, it's fine. Uh, in comparison, the Ankyo has a very similar remote, but I like it just slightly better because the Transport controls are a little wider, which makes them easier to use. And then it also has this uh, brushed metal. It's actually just plastic made to look like brushed metal. Uh, but I kind of like the look of this remote. Uh, but that being said, I'd much rather have the silver component with a black remote rather than a black component with the silver remote. Uh, and then lastly, we have just the remote control for the Oppo Blu-ray player. Now, because it's a Blu-ray player, there's a lot more going on with this remote. But this remote does have, you know, a heavier feel to it. It's heftier. Uh, the buttons feel a little bit better to press. Uh, the transport buttons are nice and big here. Uh, so I do like this one a little better. It even has a backlight, which is kind of cool. Now that's something that is more useful for a Blu-ray player. Uh, unless you're listening to music in low light, that's maybe not going to be that much of a big of a deal. Uh, but I did want to mention that the remote's a little bit nicer on the Oppo, but Overall, I think that the Rotel is just fine. Uh, so yeah, let's go back and take a look at the player itself. Okay, so we've got our three players hooked up here, and I have them running into a switch where I can switch from one to the other, and then that is running into our solid state amplifier setup. So we've got a shit Saga preamp, a shit Vidar power amp, and then we are running into our Kef LS50 speakers. Now everything that I tested in this video was done with the solid state setup. Uh, I didn't do any with the tube. I do have a pair of speakers that are going to be coming later this year and if those work out I think they might have better synergy with the tube amp and we'll take a look at them and the tube amp again. But for now we're just using the solid state because it just works a little bit better with the Kef LS50s. Uh, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about how everything sounded. So I bought the Rotel a few months ago and basically liked it right out of the box and I've been using it as a player and a transport to test some other DACs and really haven't looked back. So it wasn't until recently when I started A-Bing with these other players that I really noticed how much I like the Rotel quite a bit more than the other players and that comes out in a number of areas. Uh, one of which is it has a slightly bigger sound stage, a little bit more depth to it. Uh, the imaging is a little bit better. Uh, there's a little bit more weight to the instruments, and I think that the mid-range is a little bit nicer and sweeter as well. Uh, but the big difference is something I talk about a lot in my other videos, is it really retrieves a lot more of that room sound and air around instruments that you especially notice in audiophile recordings than the other players do, and it's pretty noticeable. And it's not the other, the other players are fine, I don't mind listening to them, but when you do the AB, you really notice how much better the Rotel is at that. Now, when you switch them to being transports, I did test all three of these using the Gashelli J2, which is my current favorite sub $300 DAC. Uh, I did like all of them better with the DAC than with their own built-in DACs, but the Rotel was by far the closest to the Gashelli in terms of sound. Now, what the Gashelli gives you is just a little bit more weight to the instruments. Everything's a little bit bigger and more life-size. Uh, but otherwise, the Rotel comes pretty close, so I can pretty happily switch between using the Rotel as a player or using it with the Gashelli, and it sounds really great, whereas I felt like the other players are not quite as good in that regard. Now, when you do want to play an SACD, uh, yeah, that, that's when the Oppo really shines. It does sound better, 
playing SACDs, the Rotel can't play the SACD part, so it's basically just playing the hybrid CD layer. Uh, so I'm keeping the oppo for Blu-rays and for playing my small collection of SACDs. But as a player, I'd say the Rotel is, is definitely my favorite, so I'm going to stick with that for now. And I will say that actually the Ankyo uh, did better than I was expecting it to. It was not quite as good as the Oppo, but it was closer to it than I was expecting. Uh, back when I was using the Ankyo as a player, I was using it with the PS Audio Sprout in the LS50s, which wasn't a great match uh, from a Synergy perspective. And I felt like it did sound a lot better using the built-in deck on the Sprout than it did using its own deck. But with this current setup, actually, it, it works a lot better. So uh, it still can't come close to the Rotel. Uh, so I am going to be moving it into another system. But it was better than I was expecting, especially for an older uh, CD player with an older DAC. But anyway, let's talk a little bit about some of the music that I listen to. So one of the CDs that I listened to was Brian Bombush, Chemistry for Gamelon and String Quartet. And this was performed by Nada Suara and the Jack Quartet. So Brian Bombush is actually an instrument designer. So he designs instruments that are loosely based on traditional gamelan instruments, which is uh, Indonesian music. And it's pretty interesting stuff. And so this group, the Jack Quartet and Nada Suara, composed a few pieces just for his instruments. And this came out a couple of months ago, and I got it on Bandcamp. And I really like it. I'd say if, if you're a fan of gamelan music, you'll, you'll definitely like this. And it's actually a, quite a good recording, too. It's The instruments are well recorded, and they have a lot of detail, but there's also a bit of a room sound. I don't think it was recorded live in a room setting to stereo mics, but it gets a little bit of room ambience in the way that they recorded it, and the imaging is actually quite good. Uh, but yeah, I really enjoyed listening to this, especially on the CD-11, which was really sort of emphasizing some of the good qualities of this recording. And yeah, if you haven't checked this out, I definitely would give it a go. Uh, you might want to see if you're into Gamble on Music first, but uh, yeah, this one's definitely highly recommended. So another CD I listened to was The Concrete Twin by Mick Karn. Uh, so if, if you're not familiar with Mick Karn, he was probably most famously known as the bass player for the group Japan, and this would have been in the early 80s. Uh, I actually discovered him in the 80s, but on a side project that he did with Peter Murphy from Bauhaus. It was called Dallas Carr that I really liked. And then from that, I was able to discover the earlier Japan music, and then later on I got into some of his solo stuff. But this was one of his later CDs that he did in the 2000s. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago uh, at a very young age from cancer. Um, but he did a whole bunch of solo CDs in the 90s, to, in the 2000s, up until the late 2000s, I think. And this was one of the ones I really liked from the 2000s. Uh, this is a great album, so it's it's all instrumental. Uh, it features his very unique bass playing, which as a bass player that is uh, very appealing to me, but also just he uses all kinds of virtual instruments and really nice sounding samples and it's a really interesting studio recording so it's not an audio file recording but it has a lot of engineered ambient sounds in a lot of these uh, songs that uh, I really like and the CD11 really helped emphasize some of that and be able to hear sort of the soundscapes as they were originally intended uh, so yeah, if you're new to Mick Karn, I think this actually is a pretty good introduction album to some of his solo stuff uh, one of the more accessible ones. Um, but yeah, this was one of the ones that I really felt stood out on the CD-11. And then I did listen to a few of my audiophile recordings, including this one, Transcending Continents and Memories, which is on the MA Recordings label. And I've talked about this one before, but this is really an amazing sounding recording, recorded in a really nice space to a really high quality stereo microphone. And yeah, the CD-11 was really shining on this. I felt like of all the players that I played this particular CD on, this one felt the most like you were almost there in the room listening to the them play. There was weight and there was just all that wonderful room sound. So yeah, it really worked out well. And I think that the CD 11 really excelled with this. So, so yeah, 
that's pretty much it. So I, I really like the Rotel CD11. I'm going to be continuing to use it. If you're looking for an excellent CD player in the $600 range, I would highly recommend it. Uh, now, if you already know that you're going to be using external DACs, the CD11 is great as a transport as well, but there are other dedicated transports in this price range, so you may want to consider them as well. But if you're just looking for a player and you don't want to mess around with an external DAC, uh, this one is a really great way to go. Um, but yeah, I think that is it for this one, guys, but I will see you all in the next video. Thanks for watching.